heartily welcome the speaker of this session, Captain Muhammad A. Al Shamsi, who is a good friend of mine and who is, a, who is the head of the firearms and tool marks section, Dubai Police Headquarters, Dubai. He graduated from the first Interpol Young Global Police Leaders Program in 2019. Captain Mohammed is a member of numerous international associations such as the Association of Firearms and Toolmarks Examiners, AFT, where he is the point of contact for the Middle East and West Asia region and a certified toolmarks examiner. He is a part of the International Association for the Property and Evidence, IAP, where he is the representative of the Middle East region. And the first certified property evidence specialist, CPES, in the Middle East and Asia. Captain Muhammad is an adjunct faculty member at Amity University, Dubai, for the Advanced Forensic Ballistics ma Master students. He is lectured and trained more than 2,100 attendees in events and training courses since the beginning of 2017 to date. In addition, he is an ex external VIVA examiner and firearms and tool marks field for both undergraduates and graduate students at institutions that teach forensic science in the UAE. Now I welcome the presiding person of this session, Srimadhi Susan Anthony, who is the assistant director of Physics and Ballistics Division of the Regional Forensic Science Laboratory, Kochi, Kerala, India. Susan Madam is one of the eminent experts in the field of forensic physics and ballistics in the country. I also welcome Dr. S.S. Murthy, who is the Assistant Director of Ballistics Central Forensic Science Laboratory, Hyderabad, India. Murthy, sir, is the chief guest of this today's session. Now I hand over the session to Susan Madam. All participants are requested to strictly follow the instruction you receive through email. Make sure that your audio is mute and video is turned off. You can mention your questions in the chat box, which will be answered by the speaker at the end of the session. <clears throat> Susan, Madam, please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Abby, for your kind welcome remarks. Welcome and good afternoon to all the participants. As Mr. Ebi mentioned, this is the 19th session in the series of webinars conducted by the Indian Criminology and Forensic Science Association. <clears throat> Today, we are going to have a session on the topic Firearms Examination and Identification and Overview. It's my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Captain Mohammed Al Shamsi. Chief guest of today is Dr. S.S. Murthy. He is the Assistant Director of Ballistics at the Central for Forensic Science Laboratory, Hyderabad, and, are, and one of the senior most forensic ballistics experts in India. He has obtained PhD from Jadavpur University on the topic image processing and pattern recognition techniques for the identification of small arms and ammunition. He is having more than 27 years of experience in the field of forensic ballistics and has solved many sensitive crime cases. There are several awards to his account like prestigious Union Home Minister Award for the best services in image processing and pattern recognition techniques. He has also published several research papers in national and international reputed journals. On the behalf of Indian Criminology and Forensic Science Association and all the participants today, I welcome you, sir. I welcome and I request you to deliver the presidential address. Please Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for such a nice words. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot. I, um, good afternoon to all participants and um, very warm welcome to Captain Muhammad A.I. Shami. Uh, just now I have been introduced to, to him. And uh, let, me, let me put in this way. Ours is Indian Arms Act 1959. And... Uh, um, and uh, in other countries like United States and all firearms, there is a constitutional right. They can go and uh, buy a firearm as very in a normal process. Whereas we, we don't, we can't do. And specifically in our country, we are having the 
uh, non-standard firearms, country made, uh, which normally we address as country made firearms, with, with their non-standard ones, of course, along with the standard firearms. So uh, the basic, uh, of course, along with other activities such as identification of firearms and ammunition and uh, identification of other cartridge cases to their linkage, firing through glasses, uh, glass sheets rather, and uh, identification of firearm injuries, etc. Apart from that, uh, we always go for a, a data bank uh, using IBIS, Integrated uh, Ballistics Identification System. So what happens that in the, in the case of uh, identification of organized crimes, these sort of things are very much useful in our country. Of course, not taking much of time, I invite you, sir, and I am really thankful to the organizers of uh, uh, the committee, entire committee uh, from India and abroad. Thank you, thanks once again, and uh, I welcome uh, Captain. Now you can take the stage, Captain. Please continue. Thank, thank you. you, thank you very much, brother. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the invitation. It's always an honor and privilege um, to be invited and be among um, esteemed examiners and ex most, uh, more experienced examiners such as yourselves. Um, today, as you mentioned, uh, we will go through the presentation uh, which is titled Firearms Examination and Identification, an overview for roughly an hour and we'll leave the rest of the time to, to discuss, to ask questions and uh, to get to know each other more. So without further ado, I would like to just briefly point out some disclaimers. Uh, points of view in this presentation are mine and do not re necessarily represent the of uh, official position or policies of the Dubai Police. Um, certain commercial, uh, commercial equipments and instruments or materials are identified in this session in order to demonstrate the examination procedure and is not intended to imply a recommendation or endorse, uh, endorsement by Dubai Police, nor intended to imply that they are the best available for the purpose. So today we will discuss five main points. I will discuss... Yes, uh, brother. Captain, can you uh, reshare your screen? It's actually out. Oh, okay. So, one second. Participants, please mute your mic. Is it clear now? Yeah, yes, Captain. Captain, please carry on. Okay, thank you. So, uh, as I mentioned, we will discuss uh, five main points. Uh, modern firearm types and mechanisms. We'll go through them very briefly. Modern ammunition to get an, uh, to get an idea of what are we talking about. Tools and instruments for uh, the firearms examiner. And then we'll discuss examination procedures more in depth. And where are we going with the fields of firearms examination and identification? Um, uh, main, uh, the, the points here mentioned are intended for all kinds of examiners, whether um, you are uh, a student in university or someone who has one or two years of experience or more. And we try to um, uh, exchange um, uh, knowledge rather than transfer knowledge over here. So uh, we start off by handguns, which is the first type of uh, modern firearms. We have two types of handguns. We have pistols and revolvers. We have hand, uh, rifles. Rifles can uh, dive into more uh, different mechanisms. You have bolt action, lever action, slide action, and automatic. Uh, most of the mechanism, uh, uh, mechanisms are dependent on the purpose of uh, the user. So some, some of the users might be going out for hunting, some of them are just going out for target practicing or self-defense, etc. Um, we have the third type, which is machine guns. We have uh, three main types of machine guns, uh, recoil action, gas action, recoil and gas. Um, generally speaking, machine guns or heavy arms are uh, used in, uh, in military. 
uh, whereas uh, some of them, such as the, the picture you can see uh, as the AK-47 or the AKM or similar, um, can be found in, uh, with normal day-to-day uh, -day people. We have, lastly, shotguns. Shotguns obviously differ between this and what, have, what we've mentioned before, generally speaking, because uh, these are smoothbore firearms, whereas all they mentioned uh, uh, previously are all rifled. Over there, we fire bullets, whereas in shotguns, we generally uh, fire pellets. Um, shotguns come in different varieties or different mechanisms. We have single barrel, double barrel, pump action, and self-loading. Um, Self-loading such as uh, semi-automatic, whether it is uh, done by a magazine, uh, tubular, etc. So the, the mechanisms for all these types of firearms that we've mentioned um, can be divided generally into four main mechanisms. So we have single shot firearms, which are generally loaded uh, by hand. Uh, you fire one cartridge at a time and remove it. You either remove it by hand or by assisting um, with an ejector. Um, uh, repeating firearms. So a repeating firearm, uh, obviously, it has more than one cartridge uh, using any sort of magazine. Um, but however, the cycling is done with muscular force. So you need to actually uh, move the action of the firearm in order for you to eject and um, uh, chamber another cartridge. Um, Semi-automatic firearms. The difference between semi-automatic firearms and repeating firearms is the cycling is done with the explosion force rather than muscular force. And in semi-automatic firearms, one bullet uh, is fired for every trigger pull. In automatic firearms, whenever you, um, if you keep on pressing the trigger or the trigger is depressed, um, projectiles keep on firing. So these are the main types of mechanisms. Obviously, we have miscellaneous firearms, uh, such as um, objects that are not intended um, to, uh, to be used as firearms. Maybe they, make, they may be canes or sticks that have a uh, firearm mechanism in them. Um, as you mentioned, sir, uh, we have, uh, sometimes you have knives or umbrellas, uh, as we see in the movies, which are actually true, or even country-made firearms, and I hope we, uh, we have an example of uh, one that we rarely don't see uh, in, the, in, the, in the session, and we, we hope that uh, you like it. Uh, modern firearms. So modern firearms are generally metallic cased firearms. Previously we had um, paper cased firearms or um, ammunition that is basically uh, breech loading or muzzle loading and all of these types of ammunition. However, uh, for the um, sake of time, we will only discuss modern ammunition, uh, which are generally divided into two. As you can see, a cartridge which is uh, a unit, an entire single unit of ammunition consisting of a cartridge case um, containing the propellant powder or, uh, with the primer or priming. Uh, so the difference between a primer or a primer assembly uh, is that the primer actually contains the priming, whereas only the priming that uh, can be found in rim fire uh, cartridges, uh, the one that is in the far right. Uh, modern cartridges and uh, shotguns generally have um, similar components. Uh, we have project, uh, here we have a projectile on the uh, two right. However, in the shotgun shell, we have projectiles so generally. Sometimes we have slugs, which are just one piece, but uh, for sake of explanation. Uh, both of them have propellants. Propellants can change depending on the, uh, the purpose uh, intended. Um, composition can change, etc. Uh, cartridge shell case. Um, so on on the left we have uh, plastic or paper, uh, depending on the the year it was made. Um, on the on the right, uh, generally uh, for center fire and rim fire, they are all metallic for modern ammunition. Um, and as we mentioned previously, we have center fire and rim fire uh, cartridges. Tools and instruments for firearms examiners. Um, generally, these are seen all everywhere. 
um, gun assembly and disassembly. Uh, we we can we can see in any lab almost a uh, small hammer, pin punches, screwdrivers, blasters, uh, pliers, etc. Um, why do we do this? Because sometimes you would see uh, certain firearms that have been damaged purposely or um, a, a, an examiner might want to actually um, visualize what is happening in a firearm that he has not encountered before. Uh, but keeping in mind that do not leave any kind of permanent mark as to this may affect uh, the, the class and the individual characteristics that the uh, firearms actually reproduce or transfer. Uh, measuring. Um, we use measuring for different reasons. Uh, we use measuring by uh, we do measuring by micrometer, vernier caliper, rulers, etc. And we can uh, use use measuring measuring for uh, measuring different class characteristics, uh, such as the width of the lens and grooves, in order for you to actually uh, check the uh, uh, gun rifling characteristics, which is also known as the GRC. Um, this is a FBI uh, database that is sent out every almost four to five years and uh, it can be helpful in the case where uh, you actually do not know the firearms. Um, cartridge analysis. Uh, so comparison microscope is always the weapon of choice which has been around for uh, since the 1925. Um, cartridge recovery trap or tank um, previously uh, what is done is actually they fire the firearms in cotton boxes. Um, a version after that came where the water tank was actually uh, vertically in the in the ground. Some of them were actually raised up the ground, um, and this is the modern one. Now there is one that came uh, to light uh, recently from Mexico, which which uh, uses pressure instead of water, but this works just as well. Um, powder and bullet weighing scales. So, uh, generally speaking, this is for reloading purposes or and um, if you find a projectile in a crime scene and you would like to know what is the caliber if it is very damaged, a weight might be an indicator for you to compare it amongst the known, uh, um, known samples. So, examination uh, procedures. Um, after receiving and going through the appropriate documentation and handling procedures relevant to your lab. So uh, why I say this? Because certain labs might have uh, one way of doing things compared to another, as long as they are documented properly and uh, or documented sufficiently and handled properly, then um, there is no complications whatsoever. Um, class characteristics are examined and individual characteristics are evaluated. So what do we mean by class characteristics? Um, class, characteristics class characteristics are generally marks that are intended um, to be made because of the uh, prior manufacturing uh, specification. So a manufacturer would actually uh, deliberately have, for example, six lands and grooves to the right, in a specific firearms uh, barrel, which is uh, again reproduced on the on the bullet itself. Um, individual characteristics are the the striations and or impressions uh, that can be found on a bullet uh, or a cartridge case that is unique only to one specific firearm. So these are uh, characteristics that are not set prior to manufacturing, and you can see different. Um, different marks on the left where you can see this This is the cartilage case. We have uh, from the top ejection port marks, we have chamber marks, magazine lip marks, um, extractor marks, breech face marks, uh, ejector marks, firing pin impression, uh, scrape marks, slide scuff marks, slide drag marks. Uh, generally speaking, these are not always there in every in every um, cartridge case. However, depending on the firearm, um, depending on the uh, metal of the firearm compared to the cartridge case, how hard it is, uh, depending on the reproducibility of these marks, these are, these are all um, features that an examiner needs to have in, in mind. On the right, we see bullets. So these are, if you see on the top, these are called uh, skid marks. These are relevantly related to uh, to revolvers where uh, they actually skid in the area between the barrel and the chamber. 
uh, we have in the bottom, as you see, lands and grooves, which we use as a sign of class and the individual characteristics. We may, we get the, the uh, an examiner may choose to um, get the number of lands and grooves, direction, even the uh, the width or um, angle of twist. All of these are factors that um, come to play when uh, an examination performs the examination procedure. So as we mentioned, uh, class characteristics are measurable features of a specimen which indicates a restricted group source. They result uh, from design factors and therefore determined prior to manufacturing. As we mentioned before, individual characteristics marks produced by the random imperfections or irregularities of tool surfaces. These random imperfections or irregularities are produced incidental to the manufacturer and caused by use, corrosion, or damage. Um, they are unique to the tool, uh, to the practical exclusion of all other tools. So these are definitions set by the uh, Association of Firearms and Tool Marks Examiners, and they are, uh, these act as a, a guide. They are not compulsory to follow. However, these are a good standard to set in order for you to compare uh, with the rest. Um, all bullets or cartridge cases fired in any gun of the same make, model, caliber will have the same class characteristics because these are all set prior to manufacturing. However, when you match individual characteristics will be found only on bullet and cases fired from the same gun, not by the person. What I mean by that is usually um, inexperienced uh, examiners, uh, maybe someone who just joined and he's do during training, uh, he will say this person actually shot uh, this bullet or fired this bullet. We do not associate a, a person um, with the evidence. We are talking about physical evidence here, so we always discuss uh, or relate the bullet or a cartridge case to a specific firearm. However, for example, you may have someone who was shot five times. You cannot determine as an examiner if that specific uh, 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 that specific firearm was shot by one single person five times or five different people sharing the same firearm, each firing one time. So this is something that uh, considerations need to be, uh, be, be paid to. Uh, individual characteristics are only examined after making sure class characteristics are similar because obviously it's a waste of time. If you know that these class characteristics are not the same, then you uh, as an examiner um, um, uh, feel sufficient that this is not the same and that's it. This is, uh, I need to point out that this is an objective approach. This is not subjective. Um, so these are uh, standard methods that have been set, set internationally. Um, these may be some difficulties that examiners might tend to face every now and then. Every gun chamber has a particular size. However, it is possible to use a number of cartridges in the same chambers. Okay, so for example, uh, 0.357 Magnum and 0.38 Special, not, re not recommended by a manufacturer, but it works. If you have a firearm called the Spanish Astra Model 400, you can actually use these uh, uh, cartridges inter interchangeability. So um, a person uh, that, is, that has this not in his mind would actually say, okay, these are not the same characteristics because the manufacturer didn't, didn't intend it to be. Um, however, it actually works. If you put it together and fire it, it will fire. So criminals, you need to remember that criminals always use what they have. So uh, this is always a point of consideration. Um, don't be hasty with excluding as soon as you see something. Try it uh, um, and throw it in your mind a couple of times, as they say, and see if actually you are certain that this cannot be, be used. A firearms examiner, when submitting a, fire, uh, a fired case of a particular type, should not jump to conclusion that it was necessarily fired in a gun, which is uh, which which it was designed for. So we have two different things that um, usually raise concerns for firearms examiners, which may be uh, subcaliber devices, as you can see. Um, subcaliber devices are generally tubes that are uh, placed in a uh, firearms barrel, and you can use 
certain um, uh, smaller ammunition or smaller cartridges um, in that barrel to fire uh, a cartridge that is not intended uh, for the firearm. So these leaves specific marks um, relevant to that device. So um, this is something that always uh, um, makes, makes, makes it difficult for an examiner. Uh, when you identify this, uh, which is very hard, then you actually need to identify it being a, um, marks transfer, transferred by the subcaliber device rather than the firearm. Because this part is always interchangeable, you, you can place it in any kind of firearm. Um, silencer is a, is a different matter. Um, silencers may leave um, um, individual marks on a, on a fired bullet. Um, uh, if you remove the silencer, uh, these marks may be removed. However, it's always, um, it's always the big picture. It's like a finger, fingerprint. Um, if you have a finger that is damaged or you have a cut, you always examine the entire fingerprint. You do, you do not just rely on one part. So it is okay. It is possible for an examiner to identify this. Um, however, uh, these are points. These are points that always an examiner should uh, have it in their mind. Um, similarly, when a barrel is cut, if you see a barrel that has been cut or sold off, for that matter, uh, marks similarly can be uh, reduced. Uh, so these are general points that examiners may face difficulties with. Now we will discuss subclass characteristics. Earlier we discussed class characteristics and individual characteristics. Here subclass characteristics are generally not determined prior to manufacturing. However, these always um, present a more restricted group. So um, features that may be produced during manufacture that are consistent among items fabricated by the same tool in the same approximate state of wear. These features are not determined prior to manufacturing and are more restrictive than class characteristics. We will go through an example um, uh, after the slide and we will see what do you mean by subclass characteristics. But generally speaking, subclass characteristics are um, a, a specific tool uh, during manufacturing of a caliber, or, or, sorry, of a cartridge, maybe damaged. And these marks are actually reproduced on in all of the, uh, the cartridges or bullets in that specific set of time. So um, these should not be confused with um, marks um, that are transferred from a firearm. Um, a way of doing that is looking at different uh, marks at the same time uh, with regards to their orientation. Um, if you have uh, uh, a specific lot, you can examine the cartridges prior to, many, uh, to, to examination or test firing them. And this brings us to two kinds, as we mentioned. We have reloaded ammunition. So reload, reloaded ammunition, depending on the firearm, you can find uh, maybe two ejectors, two extractors. You can find uh, um, two or more crimping marks. Uh, um, um, primer seat, primer seats, or uh, our camping mark can be can be visible. Um, this this is generally, as we mentioned, like the subcaliber devices. These are um, transferred from a reloading tool, so you can associate these marks with a specific tool rather than um, associating it with a specific firearm. Uh, manufacturing marks. So manufacturing marks, as we mentioned just now, uh, a specific tool during the cartridge manuf manufacturing process might be damaged. And uh, marks may be transferred from that specific tools to um, um, set cartridges, a set number of cartridges, which may actually be helpful to specify the specific time if that is uh, uh, possible. So uh, after we examine the class, uh, subclass, and individual characteristics, we go to uh, test firing. So test samples are created using the cartridge recovery trap or tank. Keep in mind always the following. <clears throat> Participants, kindly mute your mic. 
So um, always the following points are always considered. Safety always comes first. Use a two-person two rule. Um, uh, a two-person rule always have someone with you rather than firing alone because you never know. This is firearms and um, these are evidence uh, used from criminals. Sometimes, as, uh, as Sir mentioned, they, these, these cannot be uh, safe or uh, standard firearms or done by proper manufacturing where you have um, quality assured um, uh, firearms. Maybe it's a NATO or CIP or any other uh, standard. Um, sometimes you have misfire. So misfiring is actually you fire a cartridge, the firing pin strikes the primer um, or the rim of the cartridge, but it does not ignite. And some of them say, okay, what happens now? And they wave the firearm and after maybe 10 to 12 seconds, then it fires. So uh, due, to, due to humidity, moisture that can be done uh, happening in the propellant, whatever the case may be, always have the safety rule where you, ha you may be having a misfire, always have it for at least like 25 to 30 seconds, still keep it inside where it's in a safe location to fire. And then after those 30 seconds, uh, I see what is wrong, what is going on with the firearm. Um, gun reference collections, parts interchangeable. So gun reference collections, almost every lab has a reference collection of firearms where, uh, as we mentioned before, um, we might have submitted evidence where the parts are not operable or uh, some parts are damaged. Maybe I am comparing a specific bullet, but I cannot test fire the, the, um, uh, the firearm submitted to me because some mechanical parts are or have been dam damaged purposefully. Um, in this case, I can change the barrel uh, depending on the, the laws uh, governed by the country, obviously, but I can change the barrel um, to another similar firearm and only take the, take the individual class and individual marks from that, uh, from that barrel and compare the bullets um, using a similar cartridge. So um, as we mentioned, uh, the, the, the metal itself plays a big role in the density and, and how reproducible the, the marks are. And having something, uh, having the same cartridge when test firing or something at least similar will give you a good idea. If you have something different, then um, it is possible uh, that marks do not actually show the same features. Uh, but as a rule of thumb, always try to get the same cartridges. Um, always pay attention to subclass characteristics. If you see that uh, before test firing, there are specific marks, it's, it's not a big deal to just put it under the stereo microscope or a magnifier just to, to see what kind of things are you, uh, do you have on the head of the cartridge. So this is some, something to avoid uh, manufacturing marks or even reloading marks. So when, after test firing, we go to uh, the comparison microscope, uh, which is the, the weapon of choice for the firearms examiners and tool marks examiners, uh, but always consider the following. So we have appropriate magnification. You cannot have one, uh, one binocular having more focus than the other or having more depth of field than the other. Uh, appropriate illumination. Always have the same angle, the same oblique light um, uh, that are used in the same uh, two stages. Um, test marks are compared first. You always want to see what are you looking at before you, you put um, the evidence on the, on the stage. Uh, test marks are then compared to unknown evidence. However, as a rule of thumb, this is always good practice in any lab. Uh, always have a set stage for the tests and set, set stage for the evidence. So for example, in our lab, we have the, the left stage is always for the test, the right stage is always for the evidence. So we know even if we tell someone to, to like for peer review purposes, we come, someone sees the uh, pieces on the microscope, he knows that the one on the left is the test, the one on the right is the evidence. So um, these are, um, after you compare, obviously there are evaluate and then verify. So uh, as we mentioned, the procedure is, is uh, objective. However, at the moment um, we have um, subjective conclusion. So uh, someone feels that this is a match. Someone feels that um, this looks similar. 
So this is something we need to pay attention to. However, um, the range of the results or range of conclusions suggested by the AFT, which is the Association of Firearms and Toolmax Examiners, are four main conclusions. Unsuitable, uh, inconclusive, elimination, and identification. Unsuitable, obviously, is unsuitable for, for comparison purposes, whether it uh, may be a, a very damaged bullet, it, not, uh, it does not have any kind of lens and grooves whatsoever. So obviously, this is unsuitable for, uh, for comparison. Inconclusive, uh, the marks on the, the bullet or the cartridge case are not sufficient for an examiner to say that this is positively identified to the firearm or eliminated. An example of that may be um, a fractured bullet might have um, only maybe one and a half or two lands and groups um, after being damaged. And these actually don't have enough or sufficient marks for an examiner to say that, yes, it is an identification or elimination. Elimination obviously can be based on um, class and individual characteristics, similarly um, to the identification. However, in Dubai Police, we do things a little bit differently. So unsuitable is the same. However, we have uh, elimination based on class, characteristic, class characteristics only. Uh, we do not have uh, inconclusive results. We only determine that, yes, this is eliminated based on class. However, when you go to the comparison microscope, we have a match and non-match results because uh, we have noticed for our uh, court purposes and uh, public, uh, uh, public prosecution purposes, um, inconclusive is not very clear and they tend to tend to send the results again, uh, asking for another examiner uh, because they do not know or do not understand what is the procedure when, or terminology uh, for inconclusive. So we stick to non-match and match. Uh, non-match can actually be better in a way because uh, you actually um, say it is non-match whether it is for erosion, corrosion purposes, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, when it is a match, obviously it is a match. So you can see in this picture, we have uh, striated, striated marks on the head of a cartridge case, which can be, uh, I assume, sufficient for an identification. However, when you compare the rest of the marks, such as the breach face marks, like in this picture, this is also sufficient. But when you look at both of them together, the, the marks previously seen are not aligned or in alignment with uh, the breach face marks which have, have been positively identified. And this means that these are actually manufacturing marks. These are, this is another cartridge case. So we can see that the marks are still sufficient. But when we compare the, the breach faces together, that, uh, it shows lack of, of class and individual characteristics. So we eliminated this. Third example, we still have the same marks, same uh, breach face marks. And again, the uh, orientation is not the same. Having, uh, uh, there has been a paper published uh, which talks about this. Uh, so this is my paper I published this, uh, this year, which concluded that these marks are actually um, uh, caused by a galing on cutter quilling, quilling, quilling machinery. So these are specifically done for uh, federal um, cartridges or any kind of CCI cartridges because they are uh, done in the same thing. This can be done, uh, found in the AFTI journal, volume 52, number two, spring of 2020. But as I, as I was saying, um, the orientation of two cartridges um, having the same orientation of the manufacturing marks and the breech face marks or any other kind of marks is uh, 1 in 32,600. So it is a very low probability, but it is possible. That's why we always test fire 2 to 5 or 2 to 4 um, cartridges to see their producibility. And then we comp first we compare the test with tests, then go ahead with the... Uh, with the uh, questioned uh, evidence.
As uh, Sir mentioned earlier, we have uh, automated ballistics databases, uh, such as the IBIS, Ident uh, Integrated Ballistics Identification System, or Bolt Scan, or any kind of uh, system. Um, obviously, this can assist firearms examiner in a way, in different ways, such as large number of exhibits correlation in short time, um, local, national, international co uh, correlation. Maybe someone actually used a or a firearms case happened in a neighboring country where they have uh, entered it in their IBIS system or any kind of system they have, and um, the firearm was actually found uh, in another country. This can help in international and even national uh, cooperation uh, where you have a vast, uh, big, large uh, area. Um, the thing right now, what is happening all around the world is we have um, a format that is being updated for more, uh, most systems, which is called the X3P system, uh, or sorry, X3P format, which actually allows systems to share, export files in order for you to have uh, the, uh, to be free to actually use whatever system you want uh, and share files amongst different systems. Um, this is still in the process. It's a, it's a very good step forward. Uh, more standardization approaches should be done, such as um, the, the caliber of a specific uh, cartridge. Um, so at the moment, different, different systems have different uh, settings for cartridges or calibers, uh, which needs to be standardized. Um, this is something that is being done, uh, I assure you. And, uh, and obviously, the, the more the merrier. So uh, there is no use if, if uh, someone has the system and does not, does not share it or uh, have joint collaborations between different uh, entities, uh, whether it is in the same country or internationally, such as the Interpol. The Interpol has the, uh, the IBIN, which is the International Ballistics Identification Network, uh, which can be connected to the IBIS at the moment. So quantum 3D microscope is something that forensics technology um, have recently released, uh, if I'm not mistaken, two to three months ago. Um, the quantum actually is an interesting microscope. Uh, 3D microscope, which can be used as the bullet tracks in the IBIS. Uh, but it is used for a more specific purpose. The IBIS, um, as you say, uh, finds the, the, the nail in the, in the hay. However, the, the quantum looks at the class and individual characteristics of that nail. Uh, they use something called the uh, RBI method, uh, based on the authors of the published uh, paper. They visually demonstrate quantible uh, differences between matching and non-matching conditions. Uh, so this is a, a step forward. So as we mentioned before, we have a, uh, an objective approach but subjective conclusion. However, this is one step forward to, to a more uh, objective conclusion as well. Um, correlation algorithm provides line counting and pattern matching scores, which are uh, referred to in the paper NCS and uh, PMS, uh, false match rate uh, provides a reliable error rate uh, to support expert testimony, which I think will be a, a move forward for courts once they know that you can actually reproduce more, uh, uh, you can support your, uh, and as, as examiners, you can support your conclusion with uh, quantifiable uh, objective scores, uh, which are clear. So this is one step forward. At the moment, it is only for bullets. The next uh, logical step, as a, and I quote, the next logical step is to go to, uh, to do one for cartridge cases. So this is a very good uh, step towards that. We have different microscopes, and this is uh, one which is done by uh, Project Tina, which is called Vision X. So Vision X um, actually allows uh, firearms examiners to set exhibits and share what they see amongst two different users in maybe two different countries. So two different countries ha have uh, the opportunity actually, uh, if you are using this kind of microscope, you can link it to the IBIS system and uh, you can set or place a, a, a evidence bullet or a test sample bullet 
and you can tell the other lab to basically place this, the questioned one on the, the microscope and you can visualize both at the same time. However, one disadvantage of that is actually uh, you, can, you cannot control the one that is in the, in the different country. You actually need to be with them online on the phone and tell them to move it <laughs> at the same time, which is obviously not practical. So the next uh, logical thing to do is allow, allow remote control by different users. As we mentioned before, uh, homemade firearms or country-made firearms is, is, uh, uh, is something difficult. What we see right now is a 3D printed firearm. I'm sure most of you have seen something in the news related to this. So this is actually a study working group that we have uh, developed in the uh, General Department of Forensic Science and Criminology here at Dubai Police. And the reason of that was, okay, 3D printing, this was initiated back in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. And the reason for this was to explore the possibilities of what can criminals use or what can criminals do with regards to 3D printing technologies. And uh, we divided this amongst different uh, forensics field, one of them being firearms. So we have uh, printed the Liberator, uh, which is the most common 3D printed firearms. And a matter of fact, this is the first 3D printed firearms done by um, um, Cody back in 2020, uh, 2012. Um, so the printing was successful. Um, this was done by using ABS plastic. It was, uh, it was very simple. Uh, we actually downloaded the files using uh, or on the internet and went to someone that has a 3D printer and printed it very fast. We actually fired it. We have a remote firing range. We actually fired it safely inside. Um, however, the, the barrel actually exploded because we used a, a more, or a, a cartridge that was more meant for rifles rather than, uh, rather than handguns. So uh, it, it was a matter of actually balancing the material with the uh, the caliber as uh, we saw uh, small some minor cracks were observed in the front side of the firearm structure so the next thing we did was actually okay we said we will we'll lower the gunpowder okay but used reinforced plastic or fiber reinforced plastic in in some parts such as the barrel the receiver uh, uh, <clears throat> so, however we wanted still the, the elasticity uh, of the ABS plastic in the mechanical parts inside, such as the hammer, the, uh, the trigger, the, etc. So we, we actually fired it, uh, we fired this firearm twice, uh, sorry, three times. So the first two times we got the, the cartridge cases and examined it. If you see in this, oops, if you see, if you see in this picture, we have a firing pin. Okay, a firing pin generally is an, a nail that can be taken out of any door or any place you have at home. Uh, this was the only metal part that we had in this firearm. However, um, users or operators can place maybe a metallic barrel um, to, to accurately project uh, bullets. Um, or any other metallic parts. The more metallic parts you have, the, the more efficient the firearms becomes. However, uh, the less you have, the less uh, marks you have as an examiner to compare. And we have, uh, using the nail, we actually positively identified the, uh, the firing pin on both, uh, on both cartridges, cartridge cases. Um, obviously, there were no uh, no marks on the, the bullets, no marks on the breech face because all of it was plastic. Um, the thing or the theory behind firearms and tool marks examination is uh, the, har the harder material always leaves its marks on the softer material. However, this time it is the other way around. So this is this is what actually happened in the third try. So, the third time the firearm exploded. 
which is um, um, a scenario that we actually anticipated. So what will what will happen when a firearm um, is used and um, a comparison or examination is requested, which we will do using traditional methods, but more safely. Um, but in a different scenario, the firearm actually explodes. And is it, exp is it possible for uh, firearms examiners to actually um, compare and, uh, and identify a specific uh, bullet or cartridge case to that specific firearm? So uh, the, the mechanical components were scattered in the range and rendered uh, the firearm inoperable. All parts of the firearm were collected along with the firing pin, the nail, in order to identify whether the firearm could be related after explosion. So what, what did we do after this is uh, upon retrieving the projectiles, obviously they showed no class characteristics uh, with respect to firearms and tool marks from the barrel due to the bullet being harder than, uh, than what was made of plastic. Traditional tool marks and firearm examiner are done together in this scenario depending on what is available. So what we did is actually got a sheet of aluminium and placed the nail and, uh, and striked it on several angles like you would do with a, a stamp maybe or uh, any kind of, uh, of impressing uh, motion tool. So we placed it on an aluminium sheet, uh, we did the mark several times and we compared the tests uh, with the evidence as you can see and we have positively identified that. So it is possible. Um, it is possible to identify 3D printed firearms uh, if they explode during discharge or even if they are destro destroyed after an incident. Uh, 3D printed firearms should be handled and transported similarly as uh, traditional firearms. However, if the 3D printed firearm is found destroyed or partially damaged, any and all intact uh, and damaged components found in the crime scene, especially me metal pieces, which may be mechanical parts of the firearm, should be collected. So this is something that crime, scenes, uh, crime scene personnel need to consider. Uh, this is something uh, that can act as a guide and used uh, as awareness uh, in different uh, shooting incidents. This is another paper that I published with regards to 3D printed firearms. Uh, which can, you can find more details in. Um, 3D printed firearms can propel projectiles with great force more than once, but obviously you need to, uh, the user needs to, to, uh, to consider the material compared to the cartridge. Uh, microscopic comparison in this field is possible and depends on the 3D printed firearm design and material of components. So where are we going with the field of firearms on tool marks? International automated ballistic system standardization and interchangeability is done. As you mentioned before, we, we just, uh, or we are working on the X3P format in different systems and uh, certain other standardization uh, such as the, the scanning, um, scanning methods need to be considered, the steps need to be considered in order for you to actually have more accurate results. Uh, moving, I wouldn't say moving from, uh, or uh, moving from and to, I would say moving together. With, uh, so light and virtual comparison micro microscopy. We saw the quantum uh, quantum 3D microscope. So uh, virtual microscopy is, is something uh, that uh, is handy. Uh, um, and I think, such as uh, Ron Nicholas stated uh, maybe three months ago, that it will be uh, done simultaneously um, for at least uh, a number of years, maybe uh, maybe 10 to 20 years uh, before the light comparison microscopy is, is something that is, uh, is not needed. But at the moment, I think it will, it will still be there um, done hand in hand. Um, obviously, move from a objective approach and subjective uh, evaluation or conclusion to a objective approach and evaluation. So we would like to have more objectivity with regard to whatever we do, um, specifically in the conclusion part. Um, now the quantum 3D provides that option for bullets. However, we would like more options in, in cartridge cases, 
and different scenarios we can um, uh, even in two marks so this is something that the field will actually have a big jump in and uh, thank you very much for your time it was uh, uh, really fun and a pleasure to be here um, if you have any questions please feel free to contact me uh, ask me now or if you are shy maybe you can ask me later this is my email you can reach me on linkedin uh, up to you as long as you reach me thank you very much guys participants uh, if you have any questions you can post in the chat uh, captain mohammed i have uh, received the uh, mm -hmm. I mean, Kumar is asking, what uh, are all the methods used to firearm examination? Can you explain it briefly? Uh, so, Naveen Kumar, uh, Captain, already explained about it. And your second part of the question, what are the gunpowder mechanisms are followed? Can you answer for that? So, sorry, brother, can you repeat the question? I cannot hear you. What are the gunpowder mechanisms are followed? for the firearm examination. Gunpowder mechanisms? Are you following any gunpowder examination? For okay, so uh, gun, gunshot residue or GSR is divided into two categories with regards to, to firearms examiners. We have uh, distance determination, uh, which is the, the, uh, throw, the propulsion of uh, gunshot residue from the muzzle of the firearm in order for the examiner to determine a, a set distance or a range of distance. Um, this is done by, uh, by submitting the evidence, maybe it might be a piece of clothes or done by the body. This is determined um, according to the lab itself. So in our lab, for example, anything that has to do with, with the body itself, this is done with, with the medical examiner. However, it, if this is, um, on a car, on, on a piece of clothing, on, on maybe a wall, this is done by us. Um, this gunshot residue is, uh, is transferred, maybe um, uh, uh, doesn't have to be transferred depending on the surface it is on. Uh, modified grease uh, is one, depend for example, if you have a back background, uh, you cannot obviously see the particles, so you transfer it uh, using this method. You do test samples on similar uh, similar surface using the same uh, firearm, using the same um, cartridge cases in order for you to get a consistent result. Uh, if you have a silencer that greatly imp uh, implements or implicates the results, so always use the gun as the same state it was in. Uh, you do the same test marks for a range of uh, for a range of distances, um, contact near contact, um, two to three meters, depending on what kind of firearm. Whether it is um, a, a rifled firearm where you are actually examining the pattern around it, um, uh, the, the bullet, um, or even a shotgun where you have pellets, so spreading out the pellets. This is something that you need to pay attention to. Um, um, uh, gunshot residue also is divided into the other part where you actually have uh, leakage from the openings of the firearm which uh, can be on the hand, on, uh, on uh, a surface really close, maybe the wall really close to the firearm where it was fired. Uh, this is generally done uh, in, at least in Dubai police by the trace evidence. Uh, some other labs this is done uh, by the firearms examiners and twin marks examiners. Uh, however, you can you are actually um, in gunshot residue looking at different uh, different components. So uh, nitrate, nitrite particles, um, antimony, etc., barium, um, uh, depending on what you have. So even um, if in this case you are actually looking at any kind of gunshot residue, you are looking at uh, whether first of all this is uh, black powder, semi-smokeless powder, smokeless powder, uh, and we take it away from there, as they say. All right, uh, another question uh, asked by Prithviraj uh, is asking, uh, how are you managing with the country? Hi. Country made firearms. firearms. Okay, very nice. So, as we mentioned, the 3D printed firearms or any kind of uh, country made firearms are uh, firearms that are always uh, not safe. 
So uh, in this case, we always fire it remotely in terms of test firing when we, uh, but um, in this scenario, we, play, we pay close attention to uh, the mechanism of that firearm in order for us to, to uh, visualize what, uh, for us to evaluate uh, or analyze more, uh, more precisely. We analyze what kind of marks are transferred or can be transferred from that firearm to the evidence. Um, sometimes you have single shot um, homemade firearms. You can see something like a slingshot where you actually put place a cartridge and you fire only one bullet at a time. Uh, this is most common in, in uh, rural areas. However, um, uh, you obviously uh, analyze the firearm, what, what are certain mechanisms that, that it does, if it's a single shot, uh, if it's uh, repeating, if it's uh, semi-automatic, etc. Uh, in order for you to anticipate what kind of marks are there, you, you describe it, you document every kind of, of, uh, of things you may see. For example, some, some things that may be applicable in this scenario always is a barrel that is not rifled. Um, you, you place this or you, you state this, you measure the diameter of it. Uh, because this, at the end of the day, are, uh, are homemade tools. So if you have an idea of what uh, uh, these objects are made of, you can actually um, have a suspect and go back and, and link it to something they have at home. So this is always interesting uh, when you have people that actually um, not only work in the lab, um, at the same time work in the field. Uh, but yeah, it is always possible to, to to examine and identify homemade firearms. Uh, however, as I mentioned, depending on what you have uh, and what are marks that can be left uh, or transferred to the cartridge case and, and bullets. I hope I answered your question. Okay, now I request uh, Murti sir and Susan to give you a concluding remarks and uh, the question is open for discussion. You are the Malaysian expert, you can ask them for a question. Uh, are we there? Yes, yes, I am I am very much available here, sir. I am also here. Uh, really this, uh, so three of you are ballistic experts, uh, so you can have a good discussion. Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, it's it's quite uh, quite interesting lecture and uh, uh, the beauty is he started from caseless ammunition and uh, uh, the, um, uh, the caseless ammunition, the examination part is quite uh, slightly difficult and uh, he started from that and uh, um, bullet recovery methodologies uh, uh, he explained uh, uh, like box, cotton box, water tank and pressure uh, methodologies, then jib guns uh, and of course toy guns and another interesting example uh, he discussed about uh, 0.357 inch caliber to 0.38 special. That's that's really that's really interesting phenomenon that he had explained. And later the sub caliber part and uh, um, uh, and then he was explaining about the point of delayed ignition. The delayed ignition. Uh, it's the, the ignition that takes uh, after a couple of seconds and uh, we shall be, every examiner should be perhaps very much careful. Uh, he should not pick up the weapon as he rightly said. And, uh, and, uh, and, the mo and another interesting, most interesting part is of uh, uh, IBS, IBIS system, uh, the uh, identification of uh, uh, and the data storage part of arms and ammunition, specifically the fired ones, and that is that is that is really much useful in X3P format. As later on he explained about other uh, Progentina, uh, Vision X, and uh, uh, Quantum 3D, and uh, he owns two paper in the two international papers in AFTE. That's that's really of his great. Uh, um, uh, uh, rather for a, a contribution. Uh, what I wanted to con uh, contribute is here. Uh, he was uh, uh, you are addressing sir about uh, aluminium sheets. When a nail is taken and if you put uh, marks on the lead, lead sheets, those lead sheets perhaps may give better uh, uh, comparison. 
uh, rather than rather than aluminium sheets no tool marks are same in that case but the preservation of uh, lead impressions is uh, more uh, uh, interesting overall uh, overall it's uh, very glad to, to listen to your uh, uh, lecture sir and uh, the gunshot uh, residue analysis that is the gsr for lead barium and antimony and their combination so this is this is what uh, we do here as in the case of uh, scanning sem scanning electron microscopy and uh, the, there we see whether the gsr is present on the face on the on the on the palm of a fire or on the face or on the clothes that they wear including nose and ears also there there are various publications on this international publications so that uh, you can have uh, the when whenever you wash your hands after 40 uh, after few hours or couple of hours that and if uh, if you are caught if, uh, then you can get the gsr from nose you can collect the data collect the swabbings from nose or ears of a suspected fire and and uh, here we can uh, perform that uh, examination so that's what is uh, uh, done over here so it's a great lecture to uh, hear from you sir i am extremely thankful to you now over to madam thank you captain mohammad ashamsi for the wonderful session i am very glad to hear from you and i hope let the criminology and police community in our country start changing with the innovations that you mentioned here i thank all the participants for your active discussion and being the part of this webinar of indian criminology and forensic science association thank you all thank you dr murthy sir thank you susan ma'am so thank you captain mohammad for your uh, now please ac accepting our invitation and be part of icfsa so we are grateful to you all the time and you are always welcome uh, to our country uh, to share your knowledge and you know technological innovations thank you thank you very much brother i mean as i mentioned always it's a, it's always a pleasure being a part of this um, whether it is uh, A, a short session for high school high school uh, students or even um, a specific course for specialized examiners it's always a pleasure i mean even uh, murti sir uh, he explained the uh, swipes from nose and ears i mean this uh, although this is done by our press section but i'm sure it is uh, a point that uh, that they will be happy to to learn from uh, from experience thank you susan uh, and uh, thank you everyone for allowing me to to come and uh, and exchange knowledge rather than uh, than present something thank you very much for the opportunity appreciate thank it. you all the participants and invited guests uh, dr shwet prasad over to you yes uh, thank you abisa uh, thank you captain mohammed uh, for your informative section and also associating with icfsa mukti sir for you, your valuable words susan ma'am uh, abhi joseph sir anama ma'am Sarta, Tipsy, Ma'am, Ravind Sir, my colleagues of ICFSA for your time and joining in this uh, session, and a special thanks to all the participants. And we can meet in uh, the next sessions of uh, this webinar. Thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good day. Thank you, Murthy. Thank you, Murthy Sir, for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. We've been in touch with you, sir. Thank you. De definitely, definitely, sir. Thanks a lot. Uh, I know to what extent it is difficult to uh, arrange such lectures and all. Oh, great. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, it's uh, actually our responsibility to be more uh, conducting this kind of information webinars in this COVID situation, especially everyone can be at their yes, home. Yes, yes, yes. Safely and yes. share the knowledge. Gain the knowledge. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank okay, you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.